and welcome back to another episode of George on Sports with me, your host, George. And on today's show, we're joined by the one and only James Coe, formerly of NFL Network, now with DirecTV and also a fantasy guru. And also on the podcast, um, uh, Perception, no, it's not Perception, Perception, Reception, Perception even. And if you guys haven't, <laughs> <laughs> Reception, Perception, and if you guys haven't already listened to that with Matt Harmon as well, they make a great pair. Honestly, you should go and subscribe to that and listen to that uh, just like I have. But first and foremost, James, Thank you so much for coming on the show. And how are you? Nah, Georgia, I appreciate you just inviting me on, man. uh, I'm looking forward to it. Now, I've followed you for a while. Um, As I mentioned at the top of the show, obviously, you you did the NFL NFL Fantasy with guys like Marcus Grant, who have had on the show too. Um, And I'm a huge fan, so I'll just say that first and foremost. So this is cool for me to have you on the show. Um, But I think it's only right. You know, given what the news that broke earlier today, it's the 1st of February. This time last year, we had the retirement announcement from Tom Brady, which essentially wasn't the retirement announcement, except now it is official. Tom Brady, the greatest of all time, the GOAT, as we like to say, seven-time Super Bowl champion, five-time Super Bowl MVP, three-time league MVP, 89,214 regular season passing yards, which is first all-time. Oh, yeah, I'm going there. I'm going there. (laughs) 649 regular season TDs, first all-time. 13,400 playoff passing yards, first all-time. 88 playoff TDs, first all-time. I mean, what a career. What, what What is left to be said about Tom Brady? Yeah, no, uh, he's the most accomplished quarterback uh, in NFL history, no doubt about it. Uh, And part of it, uh, I mean, I guess you could critique him and say, oh, well, he's been in the league for so long. Well, you know, I would just say this. Think about how hard it is to play in the league for any longevity whatsoever. And the fact that he's been able to do it, I think, speaks to his work ethic, not just on the field, but I think off the field, too. Hey, listen, as somebody who uh, is over 40 now, like your boy over here, you know, maintaining (laughs) that level of, um, you know, professionalism and just maintaining your body and your mind, boy, that's really, really difficult. Um, And I think kudos to him for being able to do it for so long. Yeah, for real. I mean, I, I played, I tell people all the time, I played for 11 years over here in the UK. I played running back and that was enough for me. So for him to be over 40 <laughs> right. and you know, still have the zip in his arm and, and still be able to perform at, yes, they didn't have a great season, but to be able to perform at that level for a, a very consistent amount of time, you know, the TB12 method, whatever it is, the avocados, just the super fruits, I want in because that is some serious <laughs> stuff, some serious stuff. But no, you said it, the greatest of all time, there is no doubt whatsoever. Um, you know, he kept it short. He kept it sweet. Um, he showed us that he's aware of what happened last time and he didn't want to fool anyone or anything like that. So, you know, short, sweet and retiring. He got emotional towards the end. Um, I don't think we'll ever see him play again. But what I think we will see is, you know, the whole Fox arrangement where he goes into the booth. I mean, that's, it seems like something that will, you know, become the next step for him. Do you think that will, that will actually happen? That will go down? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, if, uh, if it really is about family for him, uh, for Tom Brady, then, you know, being on the road uh, as a broadcaster and doing all that preparation stuff, like that's a big time commitment, you know, so I'm not 100% sure. I know the money's going to be right, but that being said, is Tom Brady really in need of that money? Uh, he's got a lot of side ventures, too. He still has a lot of endorsement deals. He's got a lot of income coming in. It's not like he stopped playing football and stopped making money, okay? No, the dude's still bringing in. <laughs> <laughs> He's still raking it in, boy, let me tell you. So, um, <laughs> you know, how much is that Fox money worth to him? I'm not sure. Uh, and, uh, and again, I guess we'll see uh, in this upcoming season. I, you know, to be honest with you, Joe, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if he maybe takes a year off and then goes into the booth uh, just to kind of see what's what. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess all that's have to be said is, it's it, it's great that we've been able to witness the greatest of all time do what he did, you know, and whether we ever see that again. Who knows? Who knows? But um, Tom Brady, hats off to you, sir. And it's been a pleasure to watch you. Although you did destroy these my, my Colts, you know, time and time again, that hurt. Um, we're going to talk about you, James. Um, and like I said, I'm a big fan, but I want to know what led you to the NFL. What got you into the sport of American football? Well, you know, for me, I've always wanted to cover sports ever since I was a kid, you know, Um, and my journey has kind of been long and arduous. I worked in radio for a little bit. I went back to school. I got a master's degree in journalism, and then I was a cameraman for a little bit, and then uh, and and then finally made my transition into like an on air uh, person. But, you know, I, I started much of my career. 
um, covering local news, you know, and, and actually, to be honest with you, I, I was actually really, really good at it. I won a bunch of awards. <laughs> um, I've won four Emmys. I've won, you know, an Edward R. Murrow. I, I've won a lot of awards uh, for my work in journalism, in news, uh, not related to sports. Um, and then and then slowly but surely everywhere I went, I just kept asking like, hey, man, if you need an extra body doing sports like that's my passion. That's what I want to do. Um, I want to cover sports full time. And um, and my boss would be like, yeah, OK, OK, OK. And, and like, you know, they throw me a bone like I, I'd get to cover a sports story like once every six months or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. Uh, but eventually, though, um, I finally found a, a someone willing to hire me. Uh, covering sports and that was a lot of fun and um, you know I, I've covered everything you know I've covered the NBA I've covered the MLB I was a big time big time like UFC MMA boxing guy um, and actually that's kind of sort of how I made my bones uh, in in sports at first was really just being this like MMA coverage dude um, but then I've always I have played fantasy football for so long <laughs> I mean I've been playing fantasy football since 1996 Seven, I think was the wow. first season I got into it, right? So um, it's been a long time, bro. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So, um, and, and and that was the thing. It's like I, 10 years ago, if you told me, you, yeah, you're going to make a living, a good living, talking <laughs> about fantasy football, yeah. I would have never believed it in a million years. But no, I, I, I've been blessed. I've been lucky. And obviously, I've worked really, really hard uh, to get to where I'm at today. Absolutely. And the more people that I speak to um, in, in the circle, I suppose it resonates that the same thing that people always talk about is, is the hard work doing the different things. And, you know, when you do get up for the chance, being able to grab it with both hands and no doubt, you know, it's exactly what you've done. And that's exactly why you where you are today. Um, and that's exactly why, how I came across, you know, I've, I've done fantasy football for maybe over 10 years now, and you're one of the first people that I came across. And um, yeah, I've followed you all the way. So um, we're going to get straight into the games. We're going to get straight into the games that we've just had over championship weekend. Um, and we're going to start with the Eagles and the 49ers. Now, before I get into the details, it's a bit of a, I'll say it's a bit of a shame because on the, Eagle, on the 49ers part, you know, Kyle Shanahan, great head coach, potential head coach of the year, loses Trey Lance, loses Jimmy Garoppolo, in steps Mr. Irrelevant, who becomes relevant <laughs> and then loses him in the most important game of the season when he tears his UCL um, and they go on to lose 31 to seven. Now, before this game started, my, my personal opinion was I thought the Eagles were going to win. I thought that D-line was going to create too much pressure. Hassan Reddick, Sue, um, a lot of those guys, Cox. And I just thought at home, Lincoln Field, you know, Philly can be, you know, it can be rough and rowdy. You're going to go into that kind of crowd as Mr. Irrelevant, so to speak, you know, never having that experience before, it's going to get, it's going to be quite a lot for you. But you know, that the 49ers have done well, that they played well, they protected Purdy quite well. He never really needed to do too much except from utilize the weapons. In, in they come to this game and the Eagles, they, you know, they're, they're off from the, from, from the world, from the world go. And, you know, they're creating pressure against that D-line. Um, and the one thing that stood out to me was the result of this injury. And I still don't understand why the 49ers had a backup tight end who was, his role was to uh, try and block someone like Hassan Reddick. And that essentially led to the, it led to the injury. Now, I want to know, had the Eagles, had the 49ers not had sustained that sort of injury to Purdy, do you think this game would have been so one-sided or do you think it would have, it would have been a bit more balanced? Uh, obviously, it would have been a lot more balanced, and you're right. It is a shame uh, because at the end of the day, I'm not, I'm neither a, a Niners fan or an Eagles fan. I'm a football fan. I just want to watch a good game, and that, my friends, was not a good game. No, <laughs> okay, when when they're down to their fourth, fifth string quarterback uh, coming in off the street, man, like nah, it's, that is not uh, a recipe for for good things. And obviously, Philadelphia took advantage. Although I will say this, I was very surprised by the game plan that Philadelphia brought in uh, into the uh, conference championship. They wanted to run the ball. Um, yeah. And I thought, and, and at first it looked stupid to do that because, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, arguably the best run defense in the NFL. And San Francisco, where they can be beat is on the outsides, right? Well, yeah. okay, well, then they've got A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. Like, why would they not pass the ball? Uh, I think to me what it indicates is that maybe Jalen Hurts, his shoulder is not right. Um, and that's an, it's an interesting point that goes 
um, as we lead into the Super Bowl here as well. But they obviously want to establish the run. And after they were able to build a little bit of a lead, they were able to do just that, you know, and I was very surprised that they were able to do that against a rushing defense in the NFL uh, that led the league in terms of yards per carry allowed uh, to opposing running backs, right? So uh, it was very inefficient at first, and it continued to be inefficient, but then slowly but surely they just kept chipping away, getting chunk plays, picking up first downs, keeping that drive rolling and getting that defense tired and taking that defensive line into deep waters, into an area where they really have not been tested before. Um, these long drives that Philadelphia was putting together, I think just basically wore down San Francisco. And you're right. Um, look, I think that Kyle Shanahan had a hell of a coaching performance. If you think about what that offense looked like the first few weeks of the season, uh, again, with a mobile quarterback in Trey Lance, then they got to go back to just a pure pocket guy in Jimmy Garoppolo. Then they go and get their rookie, uh, Mr. Irrelevant, as you mentioned, uh, up and ready. Uh, for the you know for for the rest of the season, I, I I thought Shanahan did an amazing job. So where they go from here, I have no idea. But I've said it a million times: Trey Lance is done, ladies and gentlemen. I, I'll go out and say it, man. Like, listen, this guy has not played full time football in forever. Yeah. I you just can't do that. You 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 can't take five year four years off the game, five years off the game. And then expect to play at a high level in San Francisco. And this is a team that is built to win right now. they got to yeah. win now. They've got rookie contracts expiring. They've got Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, George Kittle. They've got Christian McCaffrey. All these dudes are in their prime right now. That defense, they could use some secondary help. But otherwise, that defensive line, that linebacking core is ready to win right now. They need a quarterback that can take them to the house right now. And I don't think that's Trey Lance. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I had this conversation with somebody else because obviously they have the conundrum where you have Lance, Jimmy, who they paid the high that they paid to be the highest backup in the league, and obviously Purdy. Purdy's scheduled to be back in six months, which obviously brings him back before the season. But you know, an injury like that is obviously quite serious. Right. And I'm 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 with you. I don't think I, I think it's unfortunate for Trey Lance because, like you said, he's hardly played. He's suffered a very serious injury, and now what? You you can't just expect him to come back and be that guy. Um, there was a lot of talk about potentially Brady. That's obviously out the out the window now because he's now he's officially retired. So, yeah, I am with you. It's a bit of a tricky one because you know they're ready to win right now. They have the team. They were close last season and the season before that. Um, so it is a tricky one. Unfortunate that the game had to go that way because at the end of the day, that isn't a game. Nobody wants anyone to be hurt in that kind of manner um, to the point where you have Josh Johnson, who you know pretty much can't do anything in the pocket. So um, a bit of an unfortunate one there. I'll just end with this with this game. There was a lot of talk about the Eagles having a ridiculously easy run as opposed to the 49ers. Now, what do you think about that? Uh, it's the easiest. My colleague John Hansen said it best. It's the easiest run I think any team has ever had to the Super Bowl. I mean, you have a bye week. That's fine. They worked really hard for that, and that's great. Uh, but then you take on a Daniel Jones-led you know, Giants team that had literally no wide receivers. I, I mean, who are these guys? that they're running out here at one. <laughs> yeah. They got no one, man. Yeah. Uh, so, no, they obviously took advantage um, uh, of, a, a, of a depleted and, quite frankly, undermanned Giants team. And then they go and see San Francisco, a game that should have been pretty difficult. But we're talking about uh, a team that lost their starting quarterback, you know, in, the, in basically the, you know, the opening drive uh, for San Francisco. So, no, nah, man, it, it's uh, – look, it, it was an incredibly easy run to the Super Bowl. The question for me is how healthy is Jalen Hurts? And then are they going to be ready uh, defensively uh, for what Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs are going to do offensively? I, I was really impressed with what KC did offensively and, and kudos to both Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. Uh, but boy, I, I tell you, it, it sure looked like he had a high ankle sprain and he was not moving around. Gr well, he was moving around great for a high ankle sprain, but just overall not moving around yes. that well. You know what I'm saying? Now, does that yeah, resolve so itself in the next couple of weeks? It might. It might. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. We might have an interesting ball game. So, that's a perfect segue to move on to the, 40, to the, the Chiefs and the Bengals. It's a rematch. Uh, the Bengals have had their number, I think, three out of the last four times. And all of those times, Burrow has looked like the better quarterback. Uh, 
Burrow's coming off, they're coming off a great win, obviously against the Bills, where, you know, they kind of basically just handed it to them in every way possible. Um, there, it's an emotional game. You know, there's a lot of talk about the Bengals about to whoop the, the, whoop the uh, Kansas, especially with the high ankle sprain, which I, that, that, I've seen, I've, I've, I've suffered high ankle sprains before, and I have never, in how many times I've, 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 I've had it, been able to recover in that amount of time, pretty much a week, and to be able to, I mean, I know this is the NFL, right? You have access to all the technologies, all the best healthcare, all that kind of stuff, which is great. But a high ankle sprain is still a high ankle sprain, no matter which way you look at it. Um, so that that kind of baffled me a little bit um, in terms of how he went on to play because he was still able to scramble. He was still still able to, to make passes. He He looked actually quite good. But Kelsey was also slightly banged up. He obviously played really well. Um, these games of the Chiefs and the Bengals always go down to the wire, and the same thing happened in this case. Um, there's obviously the debate about the officiating, which you know has taken <laughs> over Twitter in every way, shape, or form. Um, favoring yeah. the, favoring Kansas, favoring Vegas because they want them to win and all this kind of stuff. You know, you never hear the end of it. Um, penalties, and on that note, I'm, I'm bringing it to the end of the game where. Pat, and you know where I'm going with this one. Patrick Mahomes is running, you know, he's on, he's towards the sideline and he's taken right. the angle as if he's going out of bounds. He pretty much was already out of bounds. And then you get, I forget his name, um, shoving him out of out of bounds. And I think, you know, if you play in the NFL, he, he's played a sport at any level. If you lay hands on the quarterback like that out of bounds, it's always going to be a flag at any given right. time. So to do that, you bring the field goal slightly closer um, and lo and behold, they win the game in a dying seconds and, you know, um, Arrowhead erupts. I've seen all the clips and everything and everyone's going crazy and, you know, the Bengals guys have got their heads down. Um, I don't know if you've seen the clip of the Bengals guy who actually pushed Mahomes out of bounds and he's being screamed mm -hmm. at by a teammate. I think it yeah. was Pratt who mentioned, this is my yeah. last year, why would you touch a quarterback? And, you know, a part <laughs> of me feels like you have the knowledge to not do that. If you need to, just guide him. You don't need to shove him. Um, right. But what, I, what I've taken away from this game is this is the newest rivalry. This is the, the Brady-Manning. Now we've got the Mahomes and Burrow. This is the rivalry going forward, a changing of the guard, if you like. Um, what are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, no, I, you, you, you hit a lot of great points there. You know, uh, it was Joe Asai uh, that was the, the defensive player that uh, pushed uh, Mahomes out of bounds. And it was, um, yeah, I mean, listen, it's bang, bang. You know, obviously it was a foul. There, there's no question about it, but it's it, it's not like one of those it's not like one of those crazy dirty hits. It was it was a pretty bang bang play. Uh, yeah. You would have liked for him to make a smarter play. There's no question about it. Um, but I don't think it was as bad as people are making it out to be. And by the way, just to let Joe Asai off the hook a little bit, let's say he doesn't push him out of bounds. There, I mean, there's a lot of ball game left here. You know, it's, yeah. there, there's no guarantee that Patrick Mahomes doesn't then just go and make another 15 yard completion. Right. Um, it does. It, it, let's say they don't even make it. Let's say they go to overtime. Yeah. You got a whole overtime now. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like maybe Mahomes wins in an overtime. I don't know. Uh, the bottom line is the officiating was atrocious. Um, and, you know, I think I, I see so many people talking about, oh, it was bad on both sides. No, it wasn't. No, it, no wasn't. it wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> at, at every fifty-fifty call, every single fifty-fifty call, yeah. went Kansas City's way. That that third down redo was the oh one of the most God. atrocious things I've ever seen in my life. Are you yeah. kidding? Are you kidding me? You've just given um, them a way in. I, exactly. I, I mean, come on. Of course, that's when that call was the call where it tilt like it it tipped everything over. It was already leaning towards KC in terms of the officiating. But that's the call that just pushed it way, way, way over the edge uh, where it was like, OK, this is this is bad. Mm. Um, and overall, I thought it was a poorly officiated game. Um, just, but K KC definitely, definitely took home a lot of 50 50 calls. Yeah, they did. And it's hard to I mean, when you when you see these things and you're watching at home or wherever, it almost seems obvious to you, these calls. And you sort of wonder to yourself, how on earth are they getting these calls wrong when if mm. we can see it? How is it they can't see it? And now I've I've heard a lot of, of talk about potentially using um in the Premier League we have something called VAR, obviously you'll know about that. And there's you know, people looking at things like that, potentially wanting to bring that in the game. Some people are for it, some people are against it. But when you see how it's deciding games and deciding people's futures, you can really understand why there is such a big deal going on. Um 
But I mean, yeah, this these particular guys, Mahomes is going to be around for a long time. Same way um, Joe Burrow is. I think the one thing you can we we, we people can give credit to is is Andy Reid. Like they for them to for them to be back in this situation again. I say back in the in the Super Bowl with a reduced squad. I'm going to say you know you don't have the Tyreek oh, kills. Yeah. You don't necessarily. I mean Isaiah Pacheco has come to fruition. He's a great running back, but you know they're not as strong as they used to be. And for them to be able to sort of just you know, bang their way up all these games as guys like Juju, MVS, who couldn't even get a look in at Green Bay. All of a sudden, these guys are you know winning games, putting up over a hundred yards. It is something to marvel at the fact that Reed can can do this with the guys that he has. But it says a lot about him, about the team, um, and about the connection between himself and Mahomes. But um, if you look at what Kansas City has done, I'll, I'll make two points on Kansas City's offense. Okay, one. Clyde Edwards Alaire getting injured was honestly, and I and I feel bad saying this, but honestly, it was the best thing to ever happen to Kansas City. J- the combination of Jarek McKinnon and Isaiah Pacheco being able to come forward because Clyde Edwards Alaire got hurt, um, I think essentially rejuvenated this offense. You know, they had clear roles now, right? Like it was Jarek McKinnon out of the pass game, Pacheco, you know, is the is the hammer, right? And, yeah. and Clyde Edwards Alaire theoretically should be both of those. But he's not. He's not as good of a pass-catching running back as McKinnon. No. And he's certainly not as good of an early down thumper uh, as as Isaiah Pacheco. So I feel bad saying it, but it's true. CEH going down with injury honestly helped lift the Kansas City offense because after that it was very much like, okay, we've got our best guys in their best positions doing their best things right now at the running back position. Okay. Now – I will also say this. You talk about a reduced squad. 100% is reduced. Are you kidding me? Look at how good. Look at how good Tyreek Hill is in Miami. He is truly one of the top three receivers in the NFL. Go argue with your moms if you disagree, okay? (laughs) He's a top three receiver, period. Point blank, period. But I will say this. The way they reconfigured the offense in Kansas City, where it is a completely – I mean, they talk about spread. I mean, boy, this is a spread offense, man. Like – they throw to like eight or nine guys, you know, in that in that championship game. I think it was nine different receivers caught a, a pass from Patrick Mahomes. And yeah. that was with Kelsey taking home like 17 targets. Right. So yeah. they really spread it around. So they make defenses absolutely guard every inch of grass on the field. And I think Mahomes has done such an incredible job recognizing coverages, knowing who's going to be open, and getting the ball out to the open receivers. So, and he doesn't care who it is. It doesn't have to be Tyreek Hill now. It could be damn near anybody. <laughs> uh, but he's going to get the ball and spread it around. And I think he's done an incredible job. Okay, now that being said, George, whatever happens in the Super Bowl, <laughs> Kansas City needs to make additions in the wide receiver room. They don't have guys, man. They are getting by with bubble gum and duct tape, and it's not going to work long term. They got to get receiver help. Yeah, no doubt. I feel like, you know, there's always someone that comes to light, someone who's a new star in these important games. For the championship weekend, it seemed like, you know, MVS did a lot of work. I feel like you're going to hear of a guy who, you know, hasn't played that much and he's going to be the hero or he's going to score the winning touchdown. There's always that one guy because, like you said, they don't really have anybody. I don't know the status of Juju. He Apparently he needed help just walking up the stairs, whether they're doing that, to, you know, to... to play mind games I'm not too sure but I know that happens a lot in the league but you're right you're right um but before I come to your Super Bowl pick I want to ask you this question which I ask a lot of my guests too so obviously you guys you know how the league works you know how the um you know what it takes to get to the position that you guys are in what advice would you give to someone who's looking to 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 climb the ladder so to speak in the world of sort of NFL content um hosting producing what advice what words of advice would you give to them um, man, there's there. It's it's such a moving target. There's a lot of different things. Um, one thing is you you have to believe in yourself. I think you know. First of all, you're you're a former running back, right? Like you did a lot of game tape study. Yep. Um, I think I think what happens in this space is that there's not enough people doing game tape study, uh, and I just don't think they. There needs to be for you to be successful. There needs to be a marriage of what your self identity is, and what others perceive you as and those two things need a match okay you might think you're a badass but when other people see you they think you look like a nerd Mm. okay that's a problem 
right? So now there needs to be a marriage of self-identity and then what others are, are kind of expecting on first glance, right? Um, so again, kind of like you kind of sort of need to um, cultivate that look and feel of what you of what you're trying to get done finding your for for all the writers and people out like finding your voice mm -hmm. you got to find your voice okay and then and then you got to make sure that matches with what how other people are perceiving you and obviously look i'm telling you this as somebody who's on camera now if you want to be off camera you want to do you know uh if you want to do things that are you know not on camera uh, this this is not going to pertain to you as much but nowadays on social media I mean, yep. everyone's on camera. You know what I mean? So, no, uh, <laughs> I think there's some of that. And, and again, man, you, you do have to believe in yourself, dude. I, I mean, if you're not going to believe in yourself, who the hell's going to believe in you? Yep. You know, uh, dream big and, uh, and and want big things for yourself. And um, and honestly, I, like this whole manifestation thing, like I really believe in that, dude. You know, so like figure out what you want to be in like three years. Like, don't mm -hmm. go too far out. Like, that's where it gets a little frustrating and a little um, doesn't help you. Like, it's like, you know, when you first start out, you might be like, oh, well, you know, um, I don't know if you're from the UK. It's like, oh, well, I want to be the the lead guy at Sky Sports. Well, hey, listen, dude, let, let, let's let's slow down. OK, let, let's <laughs> let's start with I want to be on TV talking about football. OK. How do so now that's my that's my two year goal or my three year goal or whatever, you know, so like I believe in the whole manifestation thing, by the way, I, I just think what happens is that your brain is working on that. If you if you say that that is a problem I want to solve, I think your brain is working in the background trying to solve it uh, yep. and subconsciously moving you in the right direction uh, to try and solve that problem. So I, I would say there there's those two things. And and the fi final thing I would say, too, it's like so many people get their dreams and hopes crushed because they get one no mm. one person says no and and it's like all right well i guess i'm done then uh, and it's like listen guy you, you got to be tougher than that you know so you got to have some mental toughness here um and, and you really got to work through the no's and um and eventually you'll get a yes and that's all it takes it it should take a hundred no's yeah but it, it only takes one yes does that make any sense absolutely you know it Absolutely. only takes one guy to believe in you. It could be a hundred people who say you suck. But if one guy says you're good and he's the right guy and he's the guy that's going to sign your paycheck, you're good. <laughs> you're good. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Because let me tell you something, man. It's like you have, it's like people don't get it, man. Like people, they think there, I have gotten so many comments of like, how do you have your job? Mm -hmm. How do you have your, I've gotten that so many times in my career and it's like, listen, man, like, I don't know. I just, find, <laughs> I just believe in myself and I find yeah. one guy who believes in what I'm doing. And then this is where we're at. Yeah. Very, very wise words without a doubt. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask it because I ask a lot of my guests that kind of question. I mean, I've mentioned before, I've spoken to people like Stacey Dales, Marcus Grant, mm. and I'd like to find out what it is that they would say to people. And a lot of the same stuff resonates, you know. You, and to be fair, there's a saying where if you throw enough stuff at the wall, something has got to stick. You know, if you just keep it going, something has to stick. So, no, I, I completely understand your message, and it's loud and clear. And I think the listeners and the watchers would appreciate that one too. So thank you for that. So before we let you go, it's time for you to give us your Super Bowl pick and why. Are we going with the Philadelphia Eagles or the Kansas City Chiefs? Um, golly, this is <laughs> to me it's it's one of the most difficult games for me to predict. Um, because I don't know the health status of both quarterbacks. True, right? Very true. What is the shoulder status with Jalen Hurts? What is the ankle status with Patrick Mahomes? And if one guy is fully healthy and the other guy is not, then you, I go with that team. I just don't know what the health situation is. Okay, now that being said, given the information that I have here today uh, at the start of the month, February 1st, um, when I look at the matchup, I I tend to think Kansas City uh, is going to be able to kind of pull this one out. I, I think they could get the job done on the ground. I think they're going to be able to run on Philadelphia um, if they want to. But... I think where it gets really interesting is the fact that Philadelphia out of the slot has not been very good. Um, you look at those two corners, James Bradbury and Darius Slay, obviously they have been shut down on the outside. 
What's really interesting about the way that Kansas City is configured, though, that doesn't really impact them. You know what I'm saying? They don't really throw mm. to the outside that often. Like, who is their outside wide receiver? Yeah. They Marquez don't Valdez Scantling? Like, yeah. he is an absolute bit player for them. So <laughs> you're not really shutting down a, a critical area of the field for Kansas City, right? So, where they, where Philadelphia is a little bit vulnerable, okay, and they use a lot of this cover two shell, right? Like, it's in that like middle area of the field. Well, okay. Well, now this is all of a sudden. Now this is where Juju Smith-Schuster, Sky Moore, Travis yeah. Kelsey, especially. This is where they're going to operate. Maybe short and underneath. Maybe Jarek McKinnon gets a couple checkdowns and turns those into big gains. Right. So, it's really interesting. Philadelphia has a, such a good secondary, but they're susceptible to the middle area of the field. Uh, and I think Kansas City should be able to take advantage. Okay. Now, that being said, if it, I tell you, man, <laughs> if, if, if Patrick Mahomes, if that ankle's not 100% right, boy, let me tell you, Philadelphia and the boys, they are going to get after it. Uh, you yep. talked about it earlier, man. They know how to rush the passer. Um, they're, they're a top 10 unit in terms of applying quarterback pressure. Quarterback pressure rate, top 10 in the NFL. Um, and I like Kansas City's offensive line. They've got a good offensive line. Uh, but that battle up front, as always, will be one to watch as well. But certainly the health of both quarterbacks, um, I think, will be, will be paramount. Well, there you have it. That brings us to the end of the show. Um, James, honestly, I said it at the top of the show, but I'm a big fan of yours, and it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. I really do appreciate you taking the time out to come and have a chat with me. Um, and that is pretty much the show. Um, guys, thank you for watching. Oh, I thought you had a point. I thought you were going to drop. I thought you were about to drop a right drop and say something else. <laughs> <No. laughs> Thank you for watching, um, James. Where can people find your work, and where can they listen to your reception perception with Matt Harmon? Yeah, man. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, uh, Matt and I have uh, a pretty good podcast going. Um, it's part of our. It's a. It's a brand extension of our website, receptionperception.com. You can find that podcast anywhere you stream your podcast. But uh, but yeah, if you guys want to follow me on YouTube as well, that'd be great. Um, it's uh, youtube.com slash James Deco. Listen, if you follow, follow at James Deco anywhere, that's basically where I'm going to be. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, at yeah. James Deco, wherever you can find it, man. Guys, I recommend it. I mean, his content is great. Pro I promise you, you won't regret it. Go and follow, listen to the podcast. You will not regret it. Uh, but until next time, I've been George from George on Sports with James Deco here, former NFL Network, now with DirecTV, uh, Reception Perception with Matt Harmon. And until next time, we'll see you soon. <laughs>